Hi, everybody. Mark Summers here. And today we're going to be discussing some cool things with Nikki Boyer. We'll talk about lots and lots of sex. We would name the episodes based off of, like, what kind of kinks and fetishes the guys would have. She found somebody that wanted to live in her house but, like, live inside of a, um, a dog crate. Imminent death. She took dying very seriously. She was very mindful of, like, how she navigated who she allowed in the room. And podcasting. Oh, I have two more. I have three more. Oh, my. You know what? Can't keep track. I really like to sit in a closet by myself with a microphone. I'm so happy (laughs) to be here today. (laughs) (laughs) Plus, vulnerable conversations about fertility and making the best of life when it doesn't go quite as you planned it. Molly was a big source of support. And she was like, kids are stupid. You don't want them anyway. (laughs) Don't forget to like and subscribe to Mark Summers on Raps. Who's someone you remember that stuck with you, that time doesn't shake? My grandmother um, on my mom's side. I used to go to Toledo, Ohio when I was a kid from the time I was about eight years old for the next four or five years and spend, I was supposed to be first a week and it always ended up to be four or five or six weeks. And I identified with her. She had severe OCD and I would spend a lot of the time with cousins going swimming and actually learning golf and and going to amusement parks. But part of my day was helping my grandmother clean. You know, she would sweep the street. She was from Russia and got to this country and and everything was sparkling. And I would wash windows and I would cut her grass and I would uh, clean her kitchen with her. She had this one trip, she, a trick where she had the stainless steel table in her kitchen. And the trick was that if you took wax paper, if anybody remembers what the hell wax paper is, and, and rubbed it up and down the stainless steel, it would shine more. And that was my job on Fridays to take wax paper and shine the stainless steel. And she was a very generous woman. She, she was the best cook, made the best cookies. I loved her food. My mother was a horrible cook. Why she never picked up on it, I have no idea. But anything she made, it was, was fantastic. And when she would cook or bake and make cookies and pies and, and cakes, it was like a, a white snowstorm. There was flour flying everywhere. And I would sit back and, and watch that stuff. And we, had, we just identified with each other so well. And we have... The only person I know in my family who has blue eyes other than me was my grandmother, Clara Essek. And I don't know, we just bonded instantaneously. I would go to the store as a kid, back when you could send a kid to the grocery store to pick up stuff. And when I came back and if there was 50 cents or a dollar more, she said, yeah, you keep it. And the respect that other countries have for elderly people is far superior than what people do in this country. And and Clara Essek, or as I called her Bubba, was somebody I identified with and still do to this day I think about her. I'm excited about today's show uh, simply because it's a uh, podcast about a podcast. But but prior to that, um, Nikki Boyer is such a fascinating human being. I, I started doing research, and I realized that you're a female version of me. Okay? <laughs> That's the biggest compliment ever. Well, uh, you know, you and I have done more obscure shows that people have never heard of, but we have one or two <laughs> things that hit. But... What people don't realize is to get there, you got to do all these other oh, programs. Yeah. The work know? is still the work, right? The, the work is the work, <laughs> and you can't get good unless you do that stuff before. Oh my God, you're so right. Right? A hundred percent. First of all, that's so flattering that you think I'm the female you, because I was obsessed with you for many, many years. Really? Oh, I was obsessed with Double Dare. You How were funny. a part of my life oh, that's every nice to day. Hear. So uh, I feel like I know you. I feel. Yeah, I feel like we're already friends. We are. Um, yes, and you have to do a lot of shit to get somewhere. <laughs> and I so have true. done. They're like, did you host the awards for the factory lenses made out of Irvine? <laughs> yes, I did host that award show. Were you there? No, I just want to know what the hell it is. <laughs> I I used to say I'll do anything that gets me out and in front of people. And yeah, as you can see from looking at my IMDb page, you're like, well, there it is. Well, you know, but I tell that to people when people say to me, you know, how do I become what you do? And I say, you just got to get in front of an audience and do it. Yeah. You know, very few people, although today with, uh, you know, stupid phones and people can right. put themselves on uh, the internet <laughs> in two seconds, they get better at a younger age, I guess. I wasn't yes. that good when I, I look at some people who are 14 and I go, wow, I didn't have that ability. But those things didn't exist back when I had started this stuff. But, you know, so uh, what's the worst job you ever had in TV or in the Oh, my industry? gosh. In TV? You know, I, I hate to say this because it was where I really learned the most. Uh, but after about five years of doing the red carpets, you start to realize that it's just a charade, right? Yeah. They roll out the carpet. They put up the banners. We all sit around and eat crappy food. We're sweating in our dresses. We're all a little <laughs> I know, bit annoyed. I hate annoyed. sweating in my dresses. I right? <laughs> 
<laughs> and so, and then you wait for the celebrities to come, and we all just wait for one of them to come over and give us a little soundbite of what we need, and then we feel like we've conquered the world, and then we go home in our crappy cars to our houses, and we're like, what did I just do? Yeah. So as grateful as I was for those red carpet moments, I loved them. I worked at TV Guide Network, and I, I loved it. Um, looking back, I'm like, ooh, those were rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was at Lifetime doing a show first called Our Home, and then I did a show called Biggers and Summers with a young lady by the name of Sissy Biggers. Yeah. And we got asked to host the uh, Soap Opera Awards one oh, yeah. year. And, you know, I had never watched any one of those shows once in my life. And I had to, <laughs> you know, read. And then when people came down the red carpet, thank God I had an IFB, so people would say, that's so-and-so That's from somebody. General <laughs> Hospital, you know, because I had never seen them nor the program. We were like, hey, you, yes. come on over here. <laughs> hey, hey, you, Talk it's true. To me. And, and people, and they were feeding stuff into my ear because right. I, I didn't know what the hell to ask these people. Right. And afterwards I thought, well, why did I say yes to that? You know, I-, I, I Well, why did you? You know, I was doing a, bun- a bunch of programming for them. They had confidence in me, and I guess they had enough confidence in me to throw me into a, a program that I should have never ho- – Sissy <laughs> right. knew everything about it. She should have done it on her own, but there I was. And uh, and then I did a show at Game Show Network. Uh, I always say it was the worst experience I ever had in my entire life. It was really? a show called Win Tuition where you won money to go to college. But um, – just the whole thing was a disaster. And the production company that was doing it had never done a game show before. And we were supposed to shoot oh. like 40. And they ran out of money and we only did 32. <laughs> oh, but each day was miserable, you know? And I said, well, you know, once again, why did I why take did I this, this job? You but know? I have to say, I got... I didn't get better on the jobs that I did well. I got better on the ones that I sucked at. I so get that. I was so grateful for every mishap that came along the way because I go, oh, never going to do that again. I remember I had the IFB, which, you know, is a little thing in your ear where the your, the truck is talking to you and the truck is miles away. And I think I was doing something with One Direction. So you can imagine the mm. amount of screaming <laughs> teenagers that were in my ear. I couldn't hear anything thing. right so i didn't know what my cues were i didn't know when the camera was on me i didn't know but i think i my intuition kind of guided me but when i i never watched it back because i didn't want to see what yes. the out- i was like i'm fine just i'm fine cashing that check and just doing that job and never looking at anything i did because i couldn't hear anything yeah. i got hired once to do uh the pre-show for the oscars by uh kbc here in los angeles yeah. and there was no script and what they said to me was quote, do anything you want. Oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I tend to get a little whack. My back up, background is stand-up comedy, and so I'll right. roll the dice and go for anything. <laughs> well, there was a rumor there was some big thing happening uh, uh, on the show, and um, I talked my way past every guard who was told not to let me in, and with the camera live on KBC, really? <laughs> went backstage and found Quincy Jones, who was exec producing. And I said, hey, Quincy, can you come out here for a second? And he goes, hey, man, I'm in the middle of rehearsal. I said, just come here, come here. Oh, and so I said, hey, Quincy, uh, KBC, we're live now. Uh, so there's a big surprise happening tonight. You want to tell me what it is? And uh, Quincy Jones looks at me and goes, oh, man. <laughs> he, he said, what are you talking about? You get out of here, okay? So oh, my God. the next day, I find out that three guards that – I talked my way through, got fired Mark. because they weren't supposed to let like me you, through. With but a camera. Honest to God, but you know, I could get into Fort Knox. I just have a knack <laughs> of getting into places. You and do. I called their bosses and said, please, you know, please don't, fire, don't them. fire these people. <laughs> I, you know, I'm just an idiot who was able to talk my. And I just keep moving forward. Right. You know, I, I, right. I, I, with the stop, I just kept going. And so I felt bad about that. But, you know, you do whatever you have to do <laughs> yes, to, to you make. Do. So the other thing you have in common with me is you're from the Midwest. I'm from Indianapolis. You're from St. Louis. Lewis. Yes. So uh, what was it like growing up there and what instigated you to get the hell out of there and move right? to California? Um, I loved growing up there. I did. I loved all four seasons. I loved my family and my friends, but I knew, I just knew it was either New York or LA, right? Mm-hmm. I just had to get out. But uh, luckily enough, when I was 14 years old, I went to this audition for, um, it was KPLR TV and it was the station that aired all the Cardinals games and they had cartoons and they were looking for some teenagers who could be in sort of a dance group and sing, but also do some on-camera work. And so, of course, I was like, well, I, I can do that. So I auditioned and I got in. And then luckily enough, I had a wonderful boss who kind of took me under her wing. And she was like, I think I want to teach you how to do television. So she taught me from the age of 15 until really? I graduated from college. I was doing live little TV hits um, in between the cartoons. So I was a cartoon girl. Cool. So every kid in St. Louis knew who, you were. knew who I was, which meant 
every time I was at a bar having a cocktail. <laughs> The parents were like, aren't you that kid? Who, my, uh, aren't you the girl that my kids watch? And I would be like, what? So I had to really be cautious and careful. So from a very early age on, I was kind of being held accountable. Yeah. you know. And and I worked and I had a great experience there. So when I moved to L.A., I had all this tape. You know, you try to find an agent. And I had an agent before I moved here because I was so lucky to really? have all that experience. Who was your I first know. agent? Okay. Nicole Taylor Perry. Do you oh, remember her? She you, was my agent. Shut up. Are you yes, serious? Yes, honest no. to God. Well, yeah. Her her, yes. uh, her husband yes. was at Abrams Rubeloff in Lawrence. In Lawrence. That was my first agency. And I was with uh, Dean Parker, who started the place. Yep. And then I went uh, you know, to Richard and uh, and to Sean. No way. And then, you know, eventually. So that's funny. Mm-hmm. So what year was that? <laughs> I remember that year. That was 99 or 2000. Oh, my. Yeah, I moved out here. I was supposed to move out here with the band that I was playing with. Yeah, I was talking about that. You okay, were a yeah, singer. Yeah, yeah. I was a singer, Tell too. me about that. Let me just spread myself as thinly as possible. <laughs> I'm okay at everything, but I'm not really good at anything. Oh, my God. We're the same I, person. Th- I would say <laughs> that I have zero talent, I but I was just persistent, okay? <laughs> That's hysterical. So, so t- what kind of singing were you doing? Oh, anything. I mean, I just love... We were in a disco funk band. It was a bunch of white kids, and we were like, yeah, we're going to do funk and disco, but we would open up for all the really good disco funk bands. Really? But we got a follow. We were called Super Funk Fantasy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Don't put that on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I loved it it was like a seven eight piece band we would travel around the midwest and we would play and the guys were like we're moving to LA and I'm like I'm moving with you we're gonna get an apartment together and I'm quitting my job so I quit my job in television oh my to go pursue a band that was first of all why I don't know really I mean, how old were you you were young 19 yeah so why not right and to live with what a bunch of what your parents dudes. think though yeah. <laughs> Lo- you know what? I think my dad was terrified, and my mom was like, get it, go do it. Really? Yeah. Now, what did your dad do for a living? My dad, he was a salesman. He okay. did. He sold spray equipment. He very, like, a, a tiny little business in St. Louis, but he was, like, the top sales guy. So he, I think, deep down, there was a little part of him that wanted to um, perform and be in tr- you know, and be in the, cent- you know, the center sure. of attention. Um, so I think he wanted it for me. He was just terrified that I was 19 and going, I'm going to move in with six guys in a sure. condo and move to LA and be in a band. Well, <laughs> yeah, the band that's backed out. That's a good out. idea. Yeah, that, that sounds great and safe. <laughs> the band backed out oh, last no. minute. They did? And I Those just, cowards. I, <laughs> they were like, we don't have the money. And I was like, well, I've been working in TV and I saved like crazy. Yeah. I had a going away party. The TV station was like, farewell. Oh, and nice. I was like, I have no to go but i just packed up my car and i slept on couches and finally found an apartment and an age i got my agent and, started and what was working. the game plan though what do you want to do i wanted to you know what i love that you're asking me this i really really wanted to be an actress you did i wanted to act i wanted to be on tv shows i would have taken a soap opera i'd have been on your red carpet not <laughs> and I said, who, she? who are you <laughs> <laughs> that's right um i really wanted to do acting i just kept finding hosting work mm-hmm. i kept finding the hosting work and i'm like but i want to be an actress and i looking back now i'm sure my agents and managers were like just take the work you can get yeah. you're getting work just shut up and take yeah. it um but I, I really tried, and I got on some TV shows, and I did some guest star appearances. What and was it was your first really show? Fun. Um, I played a dead body on a murder <laughs> show where you know where they cut like do the tape on the ground. Yeah, yeah. That was me. Um, Unsolved mysteries, I think it yeah. was. And then I started playing, um, much like you had mentioned to me earlier, like your daughter played much younger than her age, right? right? So I was twenty two playing fifteen and sixteen, and I did a show called The Jersey. I did. According to Jim, remember that show? Yeah, absolutely. I did that. So I did lots of little guest stars here and there. And it was fun. And commercials. Oh, my God. I was the commercial queen. Were you really? Oh, I did commercials for anything. But that pays a, a bundle, though, doesn't it? It did. It it, it, it it seemed like back then it didn't pay as much as it does now. Like, if you would get a... If you get a campaign, you kind of are rolling in it. Right. Like flow from Progressive never has to think about anything. Oh, my God. What a right? deal that is, huh? Um, I, they didn't do it that way back then. But um, I made a little bit of money. Yeah, I did okay. I paid my rent. and I did. Uh, um, did you? Yeah, I, did well, you I went for my first commercial. I, I was with Abrams Rubin Law and yeah. And um, they sent me out. And I was this very shy Jewish kid from Indiana, okay, and I was scared of women, and and you know, <laughs> I was married about ten minutes when I get called to go do this um, copper tone commercial, mm. and I had to go in with my bathing suit, and they wanted me to quote frolic with the girls and put my arm around them, okay, <laughs> and I just 
couldn't do it. Really? I was so shy. Aww. This was like 1976 or something. Okay. And uh, the casting director basically threw me out of the audition and called my agent and said, never send him in <laughs> again. Shut up. Yeah. And But then I got my first commercial. And these are weird, and you'll probably relate to this. Um, I, I was going to do a TV show in San Francisco. I was doing warm-ups mostly at the time. Okay. And I got called to go do an appearance on, you know, AM San Francisco and talk about warm-ups on TV shows. And I was working on soap and Star Search and stuff like that. And um, I got an audition for this Richard Pryor album. And my agent called and said, oh, wow. uh, you should go and do this. And I said, I'm going to the airport. And he said, well, I'll call and see if they can see you on the way to the airport. So he said, sure enough, go. And so now there's no cell phones back then. Right. Okay. <laughs> and so I leave the house and I go into this thing and I bypass everybody else is sitting there. And I do the audition and he says on the spot, I want to hire you. Okay. That never happens. It never happens. Okay. And so my first thing was for a Richard uh, Pryor That's so cool. album. That's great. Which was unbelievable. And it played <laughs> a lot. And it, you know, it paid a, a fair amount of money. Yeah. And that sort of opened the door yeah. uh, to a certain extent. But I like you, you know, wait, look, you're like, I want to put you in my pocket. You're this cute little petite, <laughs> you know, Jiminy Cricket kind of person. <laughs> and so I can understand where you would get the hosting thing, you know? Right. You know, you, you're. Very personable, and you can oh, talk about anything. Jiminy problem. Cricket. I think I want to. I'm using that. For, I'm, that's it. That's what I am. I'm the female Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> the female, yes. What would be the female name of Jiminy? I remember. Um, that's our job. That's a good out. one. Let's figure. I got to think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, girl from Midwest comes out here, and and you do a million things, like I did a million things, yeah. And then you you land on something, and you go, oh my god. And the question I always get is, you know, how did that happen? Mm. So uh, now I'm making this transition here. Uh, <laughs> I love a good transition. Yes, and I'm, I'm okay it's about like that. like a pirouette. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, about your podcast called Dying for Sex. Yes. Okay. And s- certainly when I heard the title, I thought, well, I'm not sure this is what I think it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it wasn't, needless to say. So yeah, uh, what did you? I am curious, though. What did you, from the title, what did you think I it was? I thought it was just... about, you know, potentially uh, nymphomaniacs. Oh, got it. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And people who just, you know, couldn't do without, without it. Without it, yeah. But certainly that is not what this <laughs> is. So why don't you uh, describe what it is you're doing on Dying for Sex? Well, I love that you're asking about this because it is the most important project I've ever worked on. And it came in, it came into my life during a point when I was about ready to leave the business. I was oh, wow. done. I was like, I'm so done with really? this. I want to find something else to do. But my best friend Molly and I were driving. And actually, it's funny because she, where we're recording today, she lived near here. So it was very, like, just, I was driving through and getting very emotional because just thinking about her. So we were driving in the car. And of course, we have this shorthand. And she and I have this just, This great relationship. We've been friends for 20-something years. We met at a stupid acting class on Melrose. We were both trying to, like, really get into our inner child and find some things out about (laughs) ourselves. And she hated me, and we became best friends. You know how that goes. People hate me, and then I'm like, well, there's what I want to focus on. Not the 20 people that like me, but who's the person that hates me? Let me hang out with her. So we're in the car, and she's, you know, my best friend is is re-diagnosed with cancer. So she finds out that she has breast cancer. It's come back and it's metastatic, which means there's no cure. And she's like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do know I'm going to leave my husband. I'm going to leave for after 14 years of marriage. And I've known, I mean, I was with her the day she met her husband. So I've known her through all of this. And I said, I think, I think that's wise. She had kids? No kids. No kids. So they were married 14 years. Yeah. And so she was obviously miserable at some point there. I think they were more like friends, mm-hmm. right? They were more of like, uh, and they and he had guided her through her first round of cancer. And when you become a caretaker to someone that you love, very young, in their late 30s, it's just the dynamic of a relationship, I believe. And they they just, she wasn't feeling alive in the relationship. And so she said, I think I'm just going to start fucking. <laughs> I was like, That's what she says. I just, yeah. yeah. And I said, I fully support this. So flash well, I forward. guess let me do a little backup here since I'm new to this. Okay. <laughs> Wait, you're, you're, yeah, to so this uh, particular series. Uh, was she and her husband not having sex at the time? That is a great question. I think there were some challenges. I think she had challenges within her body because she had already had a double mastectomy. Oh, okay. She had already been on, but she had, a, you know, she got a new, a new set of boobs, which she ended up loving, um, which is a very funny story also. Because she brought me into the plastic surgeon and was like, I want boobs like that. And I basically was like, showed him my boobs. And he was like, oh, okay. Never had anyone do that. <laughs> oh, my. We were really close. Um, so they, I don't think there's, I, I just don't think their sex life was what, 
she wanted it to be. And she also had some old trauma she was trying to work through. And mm-hmm. she just could not be her best self in the confines of this marriage. So I fully supported this. And so when she got diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, she did this bold thing. She left her marriage and she went on a journey to try to make herself feel alive, as, as alive as she possibly could. And she found that through sex. But what you get, I think, in the, in the six-part series is it goes deeper than the sex. I mean, there's obviously lots of sex talk, but I think we start to learn, like, what do we want to do with the time that we have left? And how do we want people to remember us? And what does love mean? And how do you learn to love yourself while you're dying? I mean, at the end of the day, aren't we all dying? When when we would she would make jokes and say, well, you could die before me. You, we don't know. Um, and then things took a little turn and she ended up in the hospital for about four months. And we still continued to record mm. while we were together in the hospital. And we um, I think we came up with a really beautiful, profound project that I feel like is not to sound dramatic, Mark, but I feel like it's changing the world. And it's the dorky me at 14 who moved out to L.A. to like try to be an actress, to tell stories. I feel like now that I'm almost 47 and I've gotten to tell this story with my best friend Molly – I feel like I'm finally telling the story that gets to change the world and change how people feel about themselves because talking to a person that's dying, you get information from them that is just so beautiful and inspiring. So that's what the the show's about. She was honest and open, apparently. I guess the question I have to ask is, did it work? Did she find, you know, excitement and fulfillment that she didn't find in her marriage? Yes. She did. She did. And she found a deeper path into herself, which was finding, you know, I don't want to give it away, but I'm going to give it away. But she says, she says, I I may not have fallen in love in the way that I thought I was going to, but I've deeply and completely fallen in love with myself while coming to terms with all of this. And um, I think what she left behind was just a reminder of like, we don't have a lot of time here, so we might as well make the best of it. And what yeah. that may not fit, like, right, like, in the, your family may not agree with what you're doing. You, it may not look pretty on paper, but it's like you just got to kind of follow your gut and do what really fulfills you, obviously, while being safe and okay. Did she tell her husband? Yeah, she did. She did. She said, I'm not uh, having mm-hmm. the time of my life here, and I'm jumping off this uh, ship, and this is what I'm going to do. And his response was? At first, he was like, if this is virtual stuff that you're doing online, I support that. Go for it. Feel alive. Do your thing. And then she was like, I think I want to – I think I'm leaving. And so, Mark, she moved out of her home while she was, like, in the midst of chemo. Mm. So she left the safety net of her, you know, her caretaker and moved out and moved very close to me. And so I would try to help as much as possible. And he was still very involved in her life. But I think he was a little heartbroken but also supportive and wanted to, you know – help her come to terms with some things Hmm. that ended up not you know it got a little messy there as you can imagine but yeah she uh she figured it out and i think she did get what she wanted which was a path to a deeper understanding of herself and she had really great sex along the way like she did things that she you know had never dreamed of doing so she just figured why not let's just go for everything yeah and and so talk to me about this podcast does she describe what happens in those mm-hmm. uh, moments? Oh, yeah. She so, does. yeah. So, episodes one through, so we started recording and we didn't know what this would turn into. Um, and we just started recording in a studio. And I, we would name the episodes based off of like what kind of kinks and fetishes the guys would have. So, she went there. She did Dominatrix. She found somebody that wanted to live in her house, but like live inside of a, um, a dog crate. Come on. <laughs> Come on. He's like, I'll live in a dog crate and you just tell me what to do. I'm not kidding. And so, she really, See, I don't know why anybody would find that interesting or exciting, but uh, I, I don't. Me personally, yeah. I don't either. I have a hard enough time just taking care of the the people in my life that aren't in dog crates, right? Like, like <laughs> yes. that's hard enough. I don't have many left in the dog crates, as right. I remember. But yeah, I, I just I, that's so yeah. unusual to me. I mean, I'm willing to you know take some chances and do some crazy stuff, but yeah. on the same token, if somebody said that to me, I'd say, "Have a nice life, see ya." But I, honestly, I think at this point, she was like, "Well, why not? What do I have to lose?" Like, yeah. right? Well, like just explore it and see what happens. So she did dominatrix stuff. She did. Um, I mean. I don't Multiple know how, partners, yeah. I'm assuming. Um, she did some of that. Um, she did, uh, oh gosh, some of it I don't even want to say. <laughs> she found like interesting guys who have fetishes that want to be just kicked in, in the nuts multiple Lovely. times over and over again. I mean, Something I never thought about doing, but yeah. It doesn't that seem so counterintuitive yeah, to sex? Exactly. But I think she called, they called that, um, 
spank bank material. So men would want to do things with her that wouldn't necessarily end up in like your traditional idea of sex. Yeah. But they would do things with her and then I guess carry it into other parts of their life. Here's the other question. I have a friend <laughs> who uh, had breast cancer and yeah. um, to this day, and it's been 20 years, somewhat uh, inhibited and embarrassed about what she looks like there. Yeah. So I can see that. She yeah. didn't have that problem then, uh, Molly, then. Molly, th- these are great. I love your questions. These are so great. No, she didn't because she was one of the first um, breast reconstructive surgeries where they actually used her own nipples, yeah. right? So a lot of women that go through this either lose their breasts completely or they try to reconstruct them and they just, it's just hard to make it all look right. Molly's ended up looking better than her boobs looked before. Really? So she'd always say, this is not the way to get an upgrade, but I got an yeah. upgrade. So she felt very confident in her body, even though she had some scars and things. None of the guys knew she had cancer. No, she didn't bring it up in no. any way, shape or form. No. So they didn't know. No. I mean, guys really do. I mean, sometimes they don't really pay attention to it. Like, right, yeah. they're not really, like, she had some scars. She had some, you know, a little bald patch on the back of her head from the chemo. Like, she had definitely things going on. But, you know, I think the guys weren't really paying attention to that. They were paying attention to other things. But most of them did not know she had cancer. And so after, how many years or how long did she do this? This was about, I want to say, about three years. And and since you had this conversation and you were her best friend, mm-hmm. What was she saying was the best part of this? The empowerment, the um, feeling integrated into her own body because Molly had some sexual trauma happen very early on. So she just always felt like sex was bad or So I'm going to assume she was raped at a young age. Very young, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like seven. Oh, my. And I feel, and she always felt a lot of shame around it, not proud of her body. And I think once she got her cancer diagnosis, that gave her just this freedom to go, I'm just going to go have I'm fun. I'm going for it. Yeah. And th- things worked out beautifully and other things were really uncomfortable and she didn't like. She realized certain things she didn't like. Some things she liked that I was like, are you sure? Are so, you sure so about that? Here's a question I have. This okay, is an what? odd comparison. No, I love it. Okay. What, what? So Gary Shandling and I were friends and after every Tonight Show, uh, I would call him up and we would talk for two or three hours about the set and uh, I should have done the line this way. And, and, and so we would spend hours dissecting like a six minute routine. Yeah, yeah. Okay? <laughs> I love that. Did she go and have sex and call you and then give you, a, a, forget these words, a blow by blow description? A hundred percent. Really? Yes. I would check on her safety every once in a while. She'd be like, I'm going to go have a, she'd had three, four dates at a time. Like she'd do dates in the morning at 7 a.m. A coffee really? date. Yeah. She was like a serial dater. Oh my. Now keep in mind, she would have moments where she had tons of energy and felt great and then she'd have moments where she was just on the bathroom floor and couldn't move so she, when she knew she was feeling good she wanted to like go crazy on the pavement oh, really so um yes we would deconstruct we would get on the phone and i'd be like what did he look like what did he smell like what was he doing what was his apartment like tell me what you did and then what happened she so that that's funny you bring this up because we were in the car we were driving and she was, we were doing the, the Gary Shanley and Mark Sebers breakdown of the thing. And I said, I think there's something here. And I think it's a show. And I don't know how, but it's called Dying for Sex. Like it just came to really? my brain. And that was the moment we were like, I said, do you want to work on this together? I don't know what it is, but do you want to? And she's like, 100%. So we started documenting and talking. And, and that's when it all started. And so when you went to a uh, you know a podcast syndicator of sorts yeah. and said, here's the idea, did they go, oh, my God, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard? Or I don't know. I mean, what was the reaction initially? I only took it to one company, the really? company that bought it. So this is like... This goes against anything that's ever happened in my career. I've always gone on 700 auditions and I get the one, right? Yeah, of course. So I, I, Hernan Lopez, who was the CEO and creator of Wondery at the time, I knew him from a friend of a friend of a friend. And I just emailed him, right? You know, that thing like, hey, hope you're well. Here's some episodes of this email. I mean, of this, I'm sorry, of this podcast. Just wanted to see if you were interested. I think it's amazing. Now, by this time, Molly was in the hospital not doing very well. And I thought, I need this podcast to come out before she she goes. Yeah. I want people to hear this. So I sent the email. I never heard back from him. And then finally Molly started doing really poorly. And I thought, I think I'm gonna reach back out and I said, hey, just checking in one more time. I might release this on my YouTube channel. 
what am I like 12? Um, I'm going to release this on my YouTube channel. I just wanted to give you one last look at it and make sure. He said, I never got your email. Do not release it. Come into my office immediately. I never got your email. Never. So that's a good lesson, right? Like yeah. sometimes when you don't hear from people, you're like, well, guess they didn't want it. And I'm always like, follow, always follow up. Always, that's always. the key. You know, that's why most people aren't successful is because they don't follow up. My wife thinks I'm a pain in the ass because I just- Well, you, you know, probably are. Well, I so am. am I. <laughs> and, and I've had producers say to me, I'll hire you if you'll stop calling me, okay? <laughs> and uh, it's funny, recently, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who became uh, president of the Magnolia Channel and I had sent her three or four emails yeah. and didn't get anything. And I finally texted her because- yeah. Her number, but I didn't want to bother yeah. her. And I said, How come you're not responding? And she said, I haven't gotten any emails from her. And then she found them in her junk file. And she said, Oh my God, I can't, you know. Yeah. And so if I didn't follow up, I just would have figured she was blowing me off. Right. But she wasn't. She had no, no idea. Yeah. So yeah. how soon after he said, Don't sell these to anybody else, mm-hmm. did this thing launch? Um, oh, it took a year. It did. But with the beauty of Hernan and what happened is I met with him in his offices. We, um, uh, He said, you know, I, I really want, I think this is something kind of magical and I want to meet Molly. So he came to the hospital and met with her and mm. said, I promise I will help tell your story. And that was the moment I was like, this, this is, this is the way it's supposed to unfold. And so um, Molly, uh, about a month later, did pass away. So how long did she have this experience of going from bed to bed? Was it almost, I want to say like almost two and a half, three years. You know what's green and hops from bed to bed? <laughs> a prostitute. I don't know why I remember that joke. <laughs> I, I that goes prostitute. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> So again, I'm sorry. How long did did this happen? She would love that so much right now. Uh, It was like (laughs) prostitute. That's so dumb. It's funny. It's so dumb. That's what I'm known for. Dad jokes. You know. (laughs) What can I tell you? Oh my god, I love it. Um, Can I tell you one other funny? Sure. Tell me anything. She was in the she was in the hospital for four months Mm -hmm. and knew she wasn't getting out. It was a very Mm slow process but we had so much fun while she was there had great conversations but she was still in the first month she was in the hospital still having guys come in and meet her and come she, on she gave a blow job in the hospital in her robe while she was c- hooked up to an IV. Oh, swear to god and that's all that's god. featured on the podcast we actually call the guy she did that with yes and i kind of grill him and say what the hell and i get a much more beautiful and heartfelt story than i ever anticipated oh so god. yeah so, That's yeah. insane. And then a year. Okay. So then one, Molly passes away. Wondery says, we want to turn this. Your 10 episodes you recorded. We actually want to turn this into a series. And so I worked with Stephanie Jens, my EP there. And we spent a year, a year Forming working it. on. Yeah. And I'd never done anything like that before. Right? Like, you, you know, we, we go into an audition. We work on a show. We come in. We do our part. We leave. We're done. I'd never really created anything from the bottom to the top. And it was... <clears throat> It was the most rewarding thing I've ever done. As I was ready to get out of the business and be done, I was like, oh, this is why people stay. Yeah, yeah. And I loved it. And so what's been the response? What do people say uh, about listening to this? It's funny. I get different. First of all, I get five to six messages, long paragraphs from people per day still. And this is almost two years after the podcast came out, but it's still rippling. Um it's changed my life. I'm going through cancer. I'm not using sex. That was my next yeah. question. Yeah. How many other people have decided to go down this this path? You know, it's funny you say that because I just checked this email that I forgot I had. And uh, and pe- a lot of women and men are like, I never thought of this as an option, but kind of opening my mind to it. Why not? So there are multiple people out there going, huh, I'm going to go have some fun and have some sex and enjoy my body during the time that I have left. Hmm. A, the, a truck driver called me um, on my voicemail. How he got my number, I still to this day don't wow. know. Left me a message and said, I need you to know I had to pull over my truck and I'm sobbing. And I didn't get what most people are probably getting from this podcast. But I picked up the phone. I haven't talked to my mom in 15 years and I called my mom. Really? What motivated that? Because Molly and her mom had a very estranged relationship until the very end. And then they came together in such a beautiful way. So what he pulled from it was... I need to call my mom because I don't know how much time we all have left. He's like, Am I, and now we, we haven't talked in 15 years, and now we're talking. I just wanted to say thank you wow. for that. So people are grabbing whatever they need in their life. Um, and it's just I, what I'm so proud of is that all she wanted was to make a difference. And through her death, 
I think she's enhancing people's lives beautifully. And I'm so proud of her. Like, she's just, she's my North Star. I Is there a her. book? Is there a movie? She wrote a book. Uh, it's called Screw Cancer. Coming whole, right? Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Uh, and she wrote it on Amazon if you want to look for it. And uh, But she wrote it while she was in the hospital dying. She hmm. wrote her book. And I always laughed. I was like, you've been waiting to write a book your whole life. And of course, you wait till you're on your deathbed right. and you write it. And then there is um, bubblings of other things going on that I can't quite talk yeah. about yet. But yeah, it, everybody will be getting a little piece of Molly, which I think it's really all she wanted was to share that part of herself and take some of the pain that she had gone through. And the struggle, and 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 give it some purpose, and share that purpose with other people. And I think it's really helping people. I've gotten some really great emails from people saying like, "This has changed my life." And when I start to feel a little off in my life, I listen to episode six, and it remind it pulls me right back to center. And I do the same thing. How old was she when she passed away? She was forty five. How's this affected your life? Oh my god, I get emotional. <laughs> oh. It has. I'm destroyed because my best friend is gone, right? Like, oh, my heart breaks and I miss her so much. But I feel like I'm with her every day. And in a weird way, Mark, I feel almost closer to her now than I did when she was here because she is in everything I do, everything I see. She always wanted to be the most important person in my life. And I'm like, well, bitch, you bring your, there you are. Yeah. Look at you. You are the, she is the most important human in my life because she has, changed my personal life, changed my career. And she said to me before she died, I hope that somehow this story in my death makes all the hard work oh, that you've done in this crazy career. I hope it makes it worth it. Wow. And she did it. Wow. <laughs> I know. How long ago did this happen? Three years ago. And was her husband at the funeral? There was no funeral. There was no funeral. Um, he might have done a little celebration of life for her. Um, but, yeah, we don't – We there's no real communication. And he was not around toward the end. I think they sort of came to terms with um, that staying separate was good for them. Mm. Yeah, it was hard on him, I'm sure. But it, it was too much for her to navigate um, while she was dying. She took <laughs> – she took dying very seriously. She was very mindful of, like, how she navigated who she allowed in the room, who could take her energy, what nurses she would allow. She was so careful and cautious about how she spent her final month. It was amazing to watch that. Well, obviously gone way too soon at 45. That's that's know. a little frightening. Uh, and, and you always wonder in the situation how you would handle it. And, you know, I guess, you know, we're talking about mortality. You know, this is obviously not an uplifting subject, but it, but it is reality. <laughs> right. And I just turned 70 and all of a sudden I'm, you know, friends of mine are dropping like flies. You know, Saget went and then uh, Louis Anderson went and then yeah. Gilbert Gottfried went. And it's like, these are all the people that I sort of started my career with and and they're uh, younger than me and and they're going. And so, you know, I'm at a point in my, in my life where you know, I'm saying, is this the last car I'm ever going to buy? Or, is, you know. Is that, do you have those thoughts? Yeah, I have those thoughts. Because, I bet. Uh, you know, 70 seemed so far away. And, right. you know, when my grandparents were 70, they seemed like they were, you know. 106. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> but now, you know, I feel like I did when I was probably 35. I walk five miles every day. I take care right. of myself, all that other kind of stuff. But, you know, nobody knows, you know. Yep. I could, uh, you know, walk outside and who knows what the hell can happen. You know. So this book and this topic is more than sex. It's more mm -hmm. about live your life to the fullest. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we all say that, you know, take every day as a gift and mm -hmm. all that other kind of good stuff. And I'm, I'm finally doing that. You know, I worked my ass off for 40 plus years. And, you know, the old line about, you know, I'd come home and the kids would call me Uncle Daddy. You know, it's the, you know, I've been married 48 years, but I've only been home 14 of them. I do all those lines. <laughs> right. uh, but I was... Uh, you know, focusing on my career. Yeah. And I'm glad I did everything. I have no regrets. I wouldn't change a thing in my life. And I think my kids got it and they're both independent and they're both doing well and all that kind of good stuff. But all of a sudden, you start asking yourself, oh my God, how much longer? Now, my dad lived to be 87. My mom okay. lived to be 94. <clears throat> but that means nothing. I, I've had cancer for 12 years. And so... Wait, uh, really? Yeah. Oh, I and, didn't know this. Yeah. And so I'm on medication, you know, every day for that. 
and uh, I've got a great oncologist, and you know, oh knock God. on wood, I'm doing fantastic, and he saved my life. I was in chemo for two years, then I was good for about eight, and then I was in chemo again, oh and then God, it I went away, this. and then I was on immunotherapy, and you know, so I've kind of I identified with this yeah. in so many different ways. Luckily, my cancer isn't as severe, and I seem to be doing okay, mm-hmm. but that could all turn on a dime. Right. And so uh, I'm fascinated that this girl just finally said, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to go, <laughs> literally screw it. Right. I mean, I'm just going to go have the best time of my, uh, yeah. my life for the time that I have remaining. Right. I'm not sure that's a bad idea. I'm not sure it's a bad idea either. You know? Right? I mean, however... You get to whatever, you, however you heal, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not always pretty. Sometimes no. it's messy. And I think she really got a deeper understanding of herself and what she needed. And she and grabbed it, it quickly. Very quick. Yeah, that's interesting you say that. Yes, she because did. because for the first year when I was diagnosed, I was lower than whale shit. I was really? so depressed. And I couldn't get out of my own way. And they were setting up an appointment for me to go talk to a shrink about it. And I finally said to myself, I had a conversation with myself, and I said, yeah. you know what? Um, stop it. This is bullshit. Mm-hmm. There are people in a lot worse shape than you. And so snap out of it. Go do the chemo and, and move on with your life. And it, it really kind of got me out of the doldrums. But it took me a year to get there because yeah. the last word you want to hear is, you've got cancer. Right. You need to go see an oncologist, you know? Yeah. And it's the, the thing we all fear. Now, thank heavens, in these times, depending on when you're diagnosed and all that stuff, the odds of living are certainly a lot better than they were, you know, 5, right. 10, 20 years ago. But still... Um, you know, what do you want to accomplish in the time you have remaining? There's some big things to talk about, but we okay. can't talk about them with, with the other yeah, things. I mean, we got that. Yeah. So what, what else is in your life? Oh, my gosh. Oh, gosh. Well, I'm getting married. Congratulations. When? Thank you. In like four weeks, we're going to get hitched. After 13 years together, we were like, maybe we should make this official. What does this man do? He is uh, a composer, music oh, nice. composer. So he scores TV Movies, films, all that good TV. Isn't movies and films the same thing? I think so. <laughs> so when he passes away, does he decompose? <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know what's wrong with me today. You're I, bringing out the worst in me. You're welcome. <laughs> this is amazing. I love bad dad jokes. They're the best. I'm the king um, of them. So, yeah, so I'm doing that. And then I also have another uh, podcast. <laughs> with Ross. Oh, I have two more. I have okay. three more. Oh, okay. my. I, you know what? You can't keep track. I really like to sit in a closet by myself with a microphone. I'm so happy <laughs> to be here today. And you come out of the closet, huh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with Ross, he came out of the closet. Yeah. And then we did a podcast. Made a career out of it. Um, so I do Straight Talk with Ross. We uh-huh. do it once a week. Um, it's amazing. It's this little funny quirky show where if you join in you have no idea what we're talking about because it's like summer camp and all the inside jokes but then once you get in you're in so i love straight talk with ross then wondry brought me back um during covid when everyone was struggling i was working nonstop. i did a show called the daily smile and was focused on positive good news and we dug in and did 120 episodes with people where we just got Really beautiful story. So the Daily Smile is still out there. And then right now I'm doing a show called Call Me Curious where we kind of debunk life's myths. Like this, like last week it was, is is sugar really as addictive as cocaine? Or um, could you be living next door to a witch? Witchcraft. Like crazy questions that you're like, do I really need to know the answer? And then you're like, well, yeah, I need to know the answer. So we get experts on and kind of hash it out and find out. Sounds fun. Yeah. Is intermittent fasting, does it really work? Yeah. So I find out a lot, like credit cards, like how do you work credit? How do you work the credit card system? Do you really, are you throwing away free money when you throw away your credit I always card? wonder about that. Well, I, yeah. got, I got you covered. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, we do that. So I do that every week as well. And then I'm also, um, I'm always trying to come up. Molly inspired me to come up with the next really profound story. And so there's two parts of me and I kind of have a feeling you're similar. There's this really stupid dad joke part of me that wants to like walk into a room and be silly and then the other part of me wants to dig in and find your deepest darkest secret so like i feel like i have both of those parts going at all times like i love to make jokes and be silly but i also love to get to the heart of the matter so if i get to do work that lets me dip my toe in both of those ponds i'm i'm happy that's why i'm doing this podcast because uh you know the thing about it um uh, known primarily for talking about uh, Tootsie Rolls or throwing green <laughs> liquids at 11-year-olds, people don't tend to take you serious. Right. And, you know, I do have another side to me. And that's why I figured, you know, this would give me the opportunity uh, to delve into people's uh, lives and personalities. Um, and one of the things about overcoming obstacles, and I guess yeah. Molly would be the prime example of that, but in your life, um, what obstacles have you had to overcome? Ooh. 
Oh God, we're gonna go. Okay, we're we can out. Go over. You know what? No, no. I mean, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go long, but I'm gonna go deep. Okay. That sounded very sexual, <laughs> and I did not mean it that way. I promise. I the biggest obstacle, and I'm, I'm really gonna like be vulnerable here, is I tried desperately to be a mom. I went through fertility treatments. I had six miscarriages. Mm. I was in probably the darkest place I've ever been in while Molly was going through her cancer. So here she was fighting for her life, and I was fighting to create a life, and nothing was working. Hmm. Nothing. And so I had two stepdaughters that I was raising. So try being a stepmom and also trying to make your own baby and going through fertility treatments, and every time I would get to a certain point in the pregnancy, the heartbeat would stop. Mm. And it was devastating. It had to be. I couldn't see outside of it. I, I thought, oh, my God, I, I can't do this. Molly was a big source of support. And she was like, kids are stupid. You don't want them anyway. <laughs> she said that. Huh? That's hysterical. Her. So now I'm on the other side of it. That was six years ago. And right. now I'm on the other side of it. All my friends in their late 40s have, you know, toddlers. And they're all, <laughs> they're all miserable. Yeah, I mean. And I I'm, I'm think my life... The point of me telling you this and getting really to the heart of the matter is like that was my biggest obstacle. I always thought I was going to be a mom. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I thought I left my first marriage, right? Because I was like, oh, I don't think this parenting is going to work. So all of my choices were made off of I want to be an artist, but I really want to be a mom. And when the universe told me no to that, I was devastated, didn't know what to do with it, got really dark and twisted there for a minute. But then I thought – very similar to, similarly to Molly is life never looks the way you think it's going to. Yep. Ever. No matter if you got all the things you wanted on your box, they never feel the same. You check them off, they don't feel the way you think they're going to feel. So I can either be really pissed off and resentful of the life that I didn't get, or I can go, how do I make this the best life possible for me? Is there a little part of me that a sliver of the pie that always aches a little? But I'm so grateful to have a lovely partner. I have two stepdaughters. I have an amazing dog. I have a great life. And I just have to to be grateful for the life that I've been given and not live in that what if I wish I would have. And to be honest, like I'm going to go to the Amalfi Coast with you. I don't know if you've invited me or not. <laughs> um, but I'm coming and I don't have to worry about a babysitter. <laughs> so I've gotten to the other side of it. But for those of you listening... If you're in one of your dark hours, like really dark, and it gets it gets hard, just know that there is there is life outside of the troubles that you are in right now, and it, it, it does get better. It does. You know what changed my life? You mentioned your, your great dog. What kind of dog do you have? I have a St. Bernard. Oh, my God. I'm Massive. obsessed. How yeah. old is this dog? She's 12. Oh, my. So it's an older she's dog. She's a senior. She's she's a grandma, but she's like my favorite in the whole world. We got a COVID dog, okay? Oh, Which got a COVID I, dog. I, I, I did not want one. <laughs> Wait, okay? what's the dog's name? Uh, Charlie. Oh, God. Okay, and Charlie is, um, I always describe him, he's part Chihuahua, part Maltese, part oh. Jack Russell, <laughs> and 100% Tasmanian devil, okay? <laughs> right, okay. He's out of his mind. And I, I, I love this dog. Like, I, I, you know, I started from the day I got him. I'd say, Charlie, do you want kisses? And I would kiss him under his neck, oh, okay? Oh, yeah. And now when I get home, I'll say, Charlie, do you want kisses? And he lays down and raises oh, his God. head. And I kiss him here. And then he moves his neck. But they get, get the other side. Oh, other Baba, side. that's so cute. It's the best thing ever. And, and um, you know. That's another thing, you know. I had cats, and cats are like, you know, basically, hey, fuck you, you know. They walk away, <laughs> you know. You scratch me here, and then I'm leaving. Uh, <laughs> so but, funny. Yeah, but dogs. I know. Oh, when I get home, you know. And here's a funny thing. The other day, uh, I had been out for a while, and he came, and he goes, you know, ape shit as they always go. Right. And then I went out f- uh, for five minutes, came back, and it was the same thing because they the have best. no sense of time. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and so it's like, you know, they just love you to always. death. Always, yes, they do. And it's the sweetest thing. And and dogs, you know, it's another thing. You know, taking long walks and dogs. What can I tell you? I mean, D- it's the simple better. things. Nothing better. Taking walks and being with your dog. Yeah. And I'm only forty-seven. I'm not. I'm not. But I'm starting to feel on the. On the inside, my heart feels 70 because I'm like, I just want to, I moved to a retirement community. (laughs) I just want to hang out and talk to my friends and be in the pool and relax because we worked really hard for a long time. So how old is the husband to be? He's 52. So it's just a little bit older. A little bit older than me. And we're like, we really like our lives right now. It's really nice. I feel really, um, like I get emotional about it sometimes. I'm like, look at our life. 
But I'm like, look how hard we work to get here. Look at all the loss we experience and all the sadness. But like, you just have to enjoy the the, the the moments when they're good. But as I have a line in my one man show, uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get. That's so true. Uh, you know, my friend Alex Brightman, who is currently starring on Broadway in Beetlejuice, wrote that line in my one man show, and it is so true that um, you know we put in the time mm-hmm. um, because we're passionate about what we do. And you had many passions as I had many passions. Mm-hmm. And I think part of the reason it took us longer to get where we wanted to go is, we, as you said it earlier, we, we kind of spread ourselves so thin. <laughs> right. You know, I, I'm sort of like I have the attention span of a gnat. Somebody puts a shiny <laughs> thing in front of me and I, I, I go to grab it. Totally. You know, but uh, luckily, uh, like you, we found something that yeah. uh, we were able to settle in on, mm-hmm. affect people's lives, yeah. and, and maybe change people's lives for the better. And I think that's what our whole purpose of being on this planet is about, because it, you know, it it happens so damn quick. Yeah. And know. if you can just put a small fingerprint, thumbprint mm. on other people's lives, mm-hmm. as you have been able to do, and I think I've been able to do, we're very fortunate people. No, we are. We really are. Aww. Thank you so much. The first thing I want to do is when we close this thing off, I want to give you the biggest hug. I right? know. Me too. <laughs> me amazing. too, Mark. I'm so I'm so happy to be on this show, and uh, you. I you just fantastic. adore you. Thank you. Same here. Nikki Boyer, uh, I can't uh, say enough good things about her. Listen to her podcast and everything else she does. See you next week on Mark Summers Unwraps. Take care. Mark Summers Unwraps is a production of Believe Limited, created by me, Mark Summers, and Jessica Richmond. Produced by Keith Corneluck and Jessica Richmond. Executive produced by Patrick James Lynch and Ryan Geelan. Post-production support from Joshua Sterling Bragg and Believe Limited. Don't forget to subscribe or follow the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you really love it, why don't you leave us a rating and a review? Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Mark Summers on Raps. <laughs>